Okay. You ready? You just bring the mic a touch closer to you. Okay. Just, just a little bit higher. Yours is perfect. Perfect. So That's I, it. Cool. Yeah. Okay. I'm expert at this now. Yeah, you, you, you are. <laughs> Okay, cool. This is a, a bit of a different setup. Slightly different. Because um, usually you are where you usually are. I am. But I am in front <laughs> of the camera, which is very <laughs> um, weird. But um, yeah, you said you wanted us to have some time together to discuss. Yeah, I feel like it's... Uh, firstly, I've wanted the world to know who the woman is that's making this all happen. <laughs> oh, whatever. Um, <laughs> without a doubt, like I could not be... I wouldn't even become like close to launching this podcast without your support. So oh. as much as I'm the one in front of the camera and the one having to provide all the money. <laughs> uh, as you keep <laughs> reminding me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Abby Soy is 100% the person that is actually the, I guess the heart of the podcast, I'd oh. say. So thank you for all your amazing work. Oh, thank you. That's so lovely. And uh, yeah, I've always said to you that it's a privilege because you just allow me to be creatively free um and you don't usually get that to be honest um and you're open and so it's just yeah it's a really lovely working environment you are a great boss yes i, I like to think so <laughs> <laughs> you no, are I, i've honestly i have actually worked hard to try and be a good leader so i'm glad that's paying off oh that's good well i want to learn more about that i think w what we said is that within these type of conversations we're gonna kind of unpick some of the themes that we've already heard in some of the conversations we've had already, mm -hmm. but get to know you more on a deeper level and learn from you. Because I, literally, I feel like everybody that has come on here has said afterwards, can you mentor me in some way? <laughs> so it's like, okay, if, if, if they're not, if they're, maybe if you're not able to mentor them mm -hmm. or anyone else that listens because your capacity is it's gone. Is gone. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's do these episodes so people can hear from you. Um, yeah, here. So, this episode, we're going to talk about leadership. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, yes. I did not tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to talk about leadership. So, um, yeah, let's, I think let's just get right into it. Let's do whatever you want to do. Okay. So when, when was the first time you actually called yourself a leader? Uh, okay. You know what? What I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you just before I became a leader and okay. then what happened after. Okay. So... One of the most important stories of my life or one of the most defining things was um, actually basketball. So okay. way back in the day, um, when I got to secondary school, I used to absolutely love basketball, uh, but I was really, really crap at it, if I'm honest <laughs> with you. Um, I didn't make the team in year seven, made it in year eight, but just like got no minutes to sat on the bench. Mm. Um, and in year nine, I did the same thing again, made the team, but sat on the bench, got no minutes. Um, there were two outstanding players in my school. Um, Leslie Addo, one of my good friends, he actually went on to play professional. Um, so he was that good, that dedicated. And another friend of mine, Emmanuel Sunny, um, they were definitely the leaders of the team uh, without any doubt. But in year nine, we, we were able to get to the county finals. And okay, that's um, good. yeah, we keep in mind, I had no contribution. That's on the bench. <laughs> you were on the bench. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we got there um, and we got destroyed. Like, literally, like, it was, what was the score? terrible. I don't remember the score. But you remember the score? No, I don't. <laughs> I just remember being angry and sitting on the bench thinking, this sucks because even if the coach was to pick me in the game, I would probably not be able to contribute that much. Mm. And that was like a really disempowering feeling. Um, and I remember sitting on the on the bus back home with everybody, like it was mad silent. Nobody wanted to talk to each other. Like I think a couple of people might have been low key crying. People were angry. Like mm. the vibes were just off. And I remember saying to myself, I'm never going to let this happen again. Mm. And um, from literally the next day, I remember I got my, got my parents to buy me a basketball hoop for my back garden. Um, and I started working on my shot every day, worked on my ball control, all these different things every day. So by the time the summer um, had come and gone, when we came back, I was now like one of the better players like uh, in the school, uh, as well as like in the county um, as a result. Um, and then, yeah, we went on to actually get, be undefeated for oh. that, that year, including getting to the county finals again, including playing that same team. Um, and we actually destroyed them, uh, which was an amazing experience. And the reason I tell you that story is because it really showed me that 
leadership definitely does start from I guess taking control within yourself mm. seeing that there are environments or things around you that might be difficult um, but if you decide that you want to get a certain outcome and you first focus on that internal work you control the things that you can control that's where leadership begins um, even actually the end of that story is we went on another year we were undefeated again but because of our previous record we got put into the National League um, wow. and we went on to win the National Championship as well so so how were you able to because it seems like you're, within your own self mm-hmm. you created like and basically it's like a spirit of excellence like I'm going to be excellent yes but how did you transfer that to the rest of the team like how did you so actually I'm going to say yeah. like I was I was in a sense a leader of that team but I wasn't the leader of that team okay um, without any doubt like Leslie was a hundred percent like the leader of that basketball team and I'll say I definitely learned a lot watching how he conducted himself um so even that little thing so keep in mind we're all in the secondary school we're all you know what, I can't completely forget <laughs> <laughs> like so we're kids when this is all happening yeah. but I remember like every every night or morning before actually it was every night he would like remind everybody this is the game this is we're playing like don't forget to bring xyz like this and that sometimes we'll give like a few like words of uh, encouragement etc and so it's like sitting back and watching somebody be such an excellent leader um, mm. was a huge part of me learning to be like, okay, like this is what it takes. Mm. Um, like even, and another thing I learned about, I guess, leadership in that capacity was that as much as there was someone who had to be at the forefront, you did also need other levels of leadership within the team. Okay. So I'll say between myself and Emmanuel, we then kind of took on, I guess, the other responsibilities. So yeah, like sometimes Leslie wasn't in the, the right headspace to to be able to lead the team emotionally, but because of, I guess, like my nature of always being relatively chilled, I was always able to bring that calm and confidence to the team. Um, mm. Or sometimes like being able to just take a player to the side and just have a one-on-one conversation, things like that. And yeah. it also taught me that like, when you're leading, then naturally the probably the next most important person on that's around you is your first followers. So the okay. ones that come right after that. Okay. So learning to invest into those people as well was another lesson that I low key learned from that experience. Wow. All in secondary school. All in secondary school. Did you acknowledge that at that time or is it a, when you're thinking about it in hindsight that like you learned a lot? No, I, I knew at the time. I 100% I remember being really impressed by the way Leslie led um, even at that stage because I saw the impact it had on me Um, Mm. because yeah even his own desire and passion like he wanted to go pro from as long as I remember I think from year seven he said he wanted to be a professional player Mm. and he really put in the work to make that happen like really put in the work and it was contagious so seeing somebody that is literally transforming their life in front of you following their own dream um, it's it leaves you with very little excuses or you can either say, oh, like, this is what I want to do for myself. Maybe not necessarily pursuing the same vision, yeah. but knowing that if you put in that type of work and dedication, then that is what you can accomplish. Yeah. So okay. that definitely, I realized, I understood what I was seeing at that stage too. But then also I realized that there were going to be times when the person he was leading needed other people to step up as well. So definitely there were moments where the different members of the team would ha- would come to me or, or Emmanuel for support because mm. whatever was happening like Leslie's passion was a little bit too intense at times <laughs> so at times he did need that like calming additional voice or whatever yeah. um, especially as we began to bring up younger players into the team as well so we also had like a system of like informal mentorship going on so the next generation of players were also coming through and developing mm. too. Hey guys, I just want to let you know that on November the 24th, 2023, we will be hosting our first workshop of the year. It's going to be focused on helping you to become a board member. For more information, visit the Dream Nation website at dreamnation.co. That's dreamnation.co. I think when it became really real for me was about two, three years later was when I became ACS president. Um, I was ACS president. Oh, yeah? yeah? You know, I've noticed there's a lot of great people <laughs> that that's a big part of their story. Yeah, um, it's quite crazy. But carry on. It's, yeah. it's, I want to hear your story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for those that don't know, the ACS is the Afro-Caribbean Society. Um, most universities in the UK have one. And I went to Loughborough and we were not on the map for that way when it came to the ACS, like kind of like network mm. and um 
the I think a couple of years previously the ACS had been shut down. Um, I think it was there was something to do with the police, something to do with a gun, Excuse something to do with people in Loughborough. In Loughborough, yeah. Loughborough that um, didn't have. I remember one of my friends went there and she said there was no Nando's there. <laughs> what is what what is going on? <laughs> yeah, no, this was a couple of years before we arrived. Um, yeah, the uh, yeah, like it's been like incident of, with a gun, the police, somebody from Nottingham, something like that, okay. and then coupled out with I think. Um, I think this is a, this is an unconfirmed rumor, <laughs> but uh, apparently some of the previous uh, commitments have tried to do fraud through the ACS accounts. So between those two things, the union had basically shut down the ACS. Oh. Um, the year before me, somebody had come and resurrected it, but it was struggling. It was mm. on its knees, and then when it came to do elections. Um, nobody wanted to be involved like nobody stepped up including myself i wasn't even a member at the time if i'm honest with you oh, wow. um nobody wanted to step up and the uh they tried to do elections two times and then nobody wanted to be president or whatever so then by the time the third time came um something in me was just like i can't let this die because as not fantastic as it was at the time it was still important yeah and we i also saw how much the black community at loughborough needed something because we were quite separated quite dispersed there wasn't a much for us and mm. all of that sort of stuff and i was like i remember like trying to go to sleep um the t a couple of days before like you had to put your final like submission in yeah. and i just couldn't sleep like it was just like bothering me so much until i was just like you know what fine i'll run for president and see how it goes um, the very minute I said that, I was like, so much peace, fell asleep instantly. Um, so I put myself forward uh, for the role of ACS president. And yeah, like that was a game changing situation for me. Um, firstly, I, I won the election almost unanimously. Um, the only people that voted against me were the ones that literally came into the event with my, with my competition at the time. <laughs> um, and I heard a couple of them even switch sides because the votes were secret. So you can actually see. I love that, yeah. I love that for you. And I still remember what I said uh, during my election speech because I'd already started my first business at the time. Um, I was running a, a media company, uh, okay. so Starlight Imagery, but we can talk about that a whole other time. And I remember saying, I want to run the ACS as well as I run my business. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time, because we had the reputation for excellence, people were like, yeah, we want that. And I also was just explaining how I thought the combination of the skill, the talent, the ability, et cetera, that we have at Loughborough is where is very uniquely placed mm. because universities above us, like the Cambridges and Oxfords, like no shades, but actually, so I say this one? <laughs> <laughs> actually shade. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I will say it. Yeah, the, the ACS is above us. Like they've got like the intellectual side of things, but mm. they didn't have so much like the heart mm. and the like ACSs that were lower in the rankings, they had like the heart and the culture, did, yeah. but they didn't necessarily always have like the same level of talent that Loughborough did. Mm. So I was like, we are perfectly placed to do something amazing. Mm. So, and I think we can do that. So yeah, like I really took on that leadership role like with everything I had in me I threw all of myself at it um and the first thing was learning how to win over hearts and minds because a lot of people were uh let's say disillusioned uh with the whole concept of an ACS or that's the black community as a whole yeah so being able to learn how to like bring people in by firstly I guess my approach was always to show people that I care about them so show that I care about you as an individual first and foremost and understand what your needs are and what you want and that this vision isn't just mine but it can be yours as well mm. and doing that enough on a one-to-one -one small basis I was able to begin to build some momentum etc um, and we went from having about 20 members to going up to 120 members That's over amazing. the course of a year um, that made us the second biggest society at the university we went from doing about four events in a year to doing, I think it was 24 that we ended up doing over the course of the year. 24? Yeah, yeah, we were on it. Um, <clears throat> is it socials as well? Because that's a lot. <laughs> Some of them were socials. Although the one thing that I did also say is I, I banned my ACS from being able to do raves. Um, okay. Not because I've got any issues with people raving, et cetera, but I thought it was almost too easy. Mm. And like I wanted us to learn how to do things that mm. would get people involved in other ways in that regard. And also didn't let like you know it's always promoters etc it's like you know mm. you guys do that we're not going to compete we will do all the other stuff yeah 
Um, so we grew our membership, we grew our income as a consequence. We did all these events, like, and we just were able to build like the sense of family and community. Um, we won a couple of a couple of awards, uh, first time the society had ever done that. And I would say at, from that point onwards, like the ACS has been on the map. Um, so now people think of Loft ACS as being one of the best That's ACSs amazing. in the country. And I would say it was that experience which really, I, that's when I really embraced, no, I am a leader. Um, people see me as a leader, they're mm. willing to follow me, they're willing to embrace me in that. And I'm also willing to do the work to be a good one. So mm. from at that point onwards, that was hey. how I got started. Hi, I'm Courtney Daniela Boating. Hi, I'm Renee Kapuku, and we are the co-founders of Two My Sisters. And we are your next guests on the Dream Nation podcast. What I, if I was a listener of this podcast right now, what I would be wanting to ask you is how on earth do you get a brand partnership? How mm. do you do that? So I think the first thing is people are often deceived into thinking it's about the size of your platform. And one thing that I learned like from doing YouTube, and I think this was one of the key things I was able to bring to like our dynamic was like, okay, we don't need to be big. We just need to be strong, mm -hmm. right? We need to have a right. strong message and we need to build a strong community, not necessarily in size, but in devotion. I feel like um, when, from my own experience as well, I feel like when you have a leadership position, you might not, well, I, I didn't really see myself as a leader. I, I saw myself as like, I'm doing, there's work that needs to be done. Yeah. So I'm just doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but you are actually saying you acknowledged that you were a leader and in that moment and yeah. like... Cause I think it's important. Yeah. Um, I what because I I had very much so because of like I guess my upping etc. My view my view on leadership is that it's a servant. Um, it's a like you're just serving in a specific way to help people move forward with something. And so I, it's not about you. It's not about me. Yeah. But what that experience taught me is that sometimes actually not even sometimes actually the people following you do also need you to actually be a leader with your chest mm. they need someone they can point at and be like that is the person i'm following yeah so if you try to always do the humble deflect yourself as like away from yourself then you don't give people something solid to latch onto yeah so because that's really, that's really when important. when things get tough like it's they need you to step up and be like no I am speaking on behalf of these people um, and I'm going to fight for what they need. Right. And if you keep putting yourself to the side and doing this humble thing, be like, oh yeah, anyone can do that. Then it's like, yeah, it's nice. But when stuff is difficult, there's no one there. Yeah. Like they need to, people need to be like, this is who we are following. Mm -hmm. And then when that's the case, you need to have to be, have to be able to step up and lead by example. Yeah, I hear you. I, I, I have a question that I think um, some other people might as well um, around confidence and leadership because um, I think a lot of people have ideas but they don't necessarily see themselves as a leader mm -hmm. so do you do you have to be do you have to gear yourself up to become a leader if you have an idea that you want to showcase to the world like is that that's it like <laughs> I don't think there's any ways around it there's I no way around it I don't see because a lot of people don't want the <laughs> their attention or they don't feel like they have the skills to be a leader but they have an amazing idea yeah um so oh, three lessons or three ideas that always stick with me in terms of what a leader has to do um i think i said this to you before as well probably um, <laughs> yeah uh which is you need to have a vision yeah. um you then need to have the team build a team that can fulfill that vision and then you then need to uh give that team the resource they need to succeed so let's say you've just got to the vision stage you've got a really good idea mm. that you can articulate to yourself to other people around you to the outside world etc mm. the chances are if it's going to be a game-changing idea that you can't do it by yourself mm. it's that simple so therefore the next step is you now need to build a team and if you're going to build a team but you're not going to be a leader yeah you've, 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 you've failed at the first yeah. hurdle so um, being a leader doesn't mean you have to be like some big social media thing or have thousands of followers or anything like that. You can still be relatively low key. Many of the people that have done like amazing things in this world have been good leaders, but they mm. will never be like in a book, for example. Mm. And that's okay. But the rules of leadership are kind of unbreakable and so are the rules of change. If you want to have a meaningful impact on the world, then you will have to learn to be a good leader. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. Hey there, thank you so much for listening to today's episode. 
One thing that we want to do is want to make this as interactive as possible. And with that, I would love to hear if you have any questions or dilemmas you would like us to address in the episode. To do that, visit dreamnation.co forward slash podcast and submit the form that you'll see there. You've, you've said before, um, you haven't said it on camera, but you said before that at one point Dream Nation had 20 employees. Yeah. Um, and right now we have three. Two, I would say three. Three, yeah. yeah. Um, so when you were talking about the step about choosing the team and having the right people around you, which is probably the most difficult part to initially like building everything like yeah. what has your experience been like how d- even just thinking about having 20 I'm just like this is what I mean in the in the future it will definitely probably go up again to that <laughs> yeah but like how did you navigate that with all your ideas even the first idea you said you had at uni like building a team what has that been like for you building a team is the hardest thing in in life and business mm. like even within all the companies I, I sit on boards for now we're involved in it's still the biggest challenge is the right people the right talent in the right place mm. um what was it like the very first team I built was for my very first business so in set not secondary school in college I started uh, a company called Cosmic Sports Cosmic Sports. Uh, cosmic Sports, yeah. Okay, tell me what was this <laughs> Cosmic. <laughs> uh, cosmic was the nickname I had from basketball. So oh, that was your, was that your tag? That was my tag, yes. Explain. <laughs> mm, basically, um, as, so I was a pretty good basketball player, as we know. Yeah. Um, as you may have also noticed, although I am above average height, but I am not six foot six, you know okay. what I mean? I'm not the tallest guy. Um so the reason I was able to compete is because I can jump extremely high. Okay, um, Cosmic. That's gotcha. where the nickname Cosmic came from. Okay, okay. Um, so then I started this company called Cosmic Sports to organize sports training camps and tournaments. Oh, cool. Um, it didn't get very big at all, but it was the first, my first introduction to business. Um, and it's also where I went to Loughborough, because obviously Loughborough is a sports yes. university. So that's how that all connects up. Um, when I was running that company, I built my first team. And I literally just went for whoever was kind of available that showed not even any interest in my business. Just, oh, you've got this kind of skill. You're, you're someone that I know do want to be involved in this. Mm. And yeah, people were very quick to say yes. But when push came to shove, like they didn't show up or do no work consistently. And that really showed me, it's just like, yeah, you can't just, you, like people have to first buy you, like really buy into the vision mm. and then you have to buy in, they have to also show their commitment to what it is that you're doing. Mm. Otherwise, like it's not going to work out. The one person I did recruit, um, he wasn't a mistake, was my best friend Bola. Um, he came on because Bola's always been good with numbers for as long as I've known him. So he came on to do like accounting stuff. I don't know what account stuff he was doing because there was no money. <laughs> um, but I was like, yeah, I need, I need an accountant. You need to come through. So that was the first version of the team that I built um some at some point during university I think just after my first year I realized the cosmic sports thing was not going anywhere um largely not because it was a bad idea but mostly because I had a better idea which is um I'd started doing photography so I'd bought this like professional camera to take pictures at my sports events Mm. I was organizing um, but by the time I got to university, people kept asking me to come and take pictures of other things. Mm. Um, so like their clothing lines or their events, etc. And I realized that there's actually a much bigger opportunity for me as a photographer than yeah. there was in sports tournaments. So I closed that down. It's out of the company I mentioned, Starlight Imagery. You might notice there's a space theme going on. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think back then my like parent company used to be called Cosmic Incorporated or Cosmic Inc. So. Wow. <laughs> How many companies have you had? Oh, like fully registered businesses yeah. three okay. in terms of different brands maybe about 10 okay um right. so yeah okay. um sorry carry on yeah. i just wanted <laughs> <laughs> um where was i so yeah so with starlight imagery um i'd learned my lesson with cosmic sports about how to build a team mm. and i also saw he was really down for the cause and that was bola so I brought him on board um, mm. and he did once again handle the finances, which was needed this time. So invoicing people, stuff like that, yeah. making sure that we're making good decisions, starting to negotiate deals on the side, really important from that angle. And then I realized that I want to do what I think what a lot of entrepreneurs get, which is like, I don't want to handle any admin. I just want to go and be the creative visionary person. Yeah. So I actually then made Bola the CEO of, Star- of um, uh, Starlight Imagery. And I just was like the creative director in that wow. regard. 
um, which was a good decision. He was a fantastic CEO, in all honesty, and a lot of like amazing things happened as a consequence of that decision. Um, Wait, let's not let's not go go past that really quickly. You let go of that title to be the creative director, yeah, which is somebody that you know you can hire a creative director. Mm-hmm. How did you? How were you able to to make that decision? I think it's quite a big one. To me, it didn't feel like a big one to me. Mm. Like, I understood what it looked like on the outside in terms of, like, yeah, if I don't have the CEO title, then people would be like, oh, like, blah, 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 think, mm. whatever. To me, I was just like, where do our skills align? Um, and this is also somebody that I trust. Like, you have to remember, I legitimately trust all of my life. Um, I remember when I went on, uh, I had to go to Jamaica on, a, like, an emergency tip, some family stuff to sort out. I remember I just... Gave, like literally just left him with all my credit cards for, for anything that needs to be done just like yo bro like if there's anything that pops up needs to be sorted let's get it sorted do you know what I mean um yeah so I trust him with my life and I think if you're gonna have someone who's gonna be your co-founder which is how I treated him like I'd given him at this point 50% of the company all of that wow. then it's just like yeah if you can't trust him with your life then what's the point um co-founder relationships are basically marriages and actually in many cases last longer than most people's marriages as well Yikes. so <laughs> you need to really think about who it is that you have as that those foundational pieces to your company or your vision and then um yeah make sure you can trust that person so that decision to me was easy in that moment with with him but mm. it's not necessarily an easy decision in other situations because yeah. not everybody can do trust to that level um so kind of going back to Starlight, we were beginning to grow. Um, we had now uh, also like built a studio up in the Midlands. So we had like our own media studio, similar to like what you're looking at here. We had this, but not as good, but <laughs> we move. Um, and we had now kind of evolved from being photography to start doing video production to then actually going beyond that and start doing being more of like a marketing agency. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like I was realizing that I was like, had so much work I had to get done. So at this point, we brought on who was, he first came on as an intern and that's just because like he, he kind of just saw what I was doing around the, around the Midlands at the time. And he was just like, I just want to be involved and learn, like learn from you how to do this. Mm. And that's a guy called Ali Farugi. Um, I think I've mentioned him because I think he'll be amazing to be on the podcast. Um, and yeah, he then was like a, became like my first real employee, I guess. Like the first time somebody kind of like, trusted in like me so much that like I'm going to put my career yeah. in your hands essentially yeah. um, and the first time I always had to be like oh I need to make enough money to pay this guy as well mm. sort of thing um, and once again he showed that he could be trusted so I just I also just gave him keys to the studio all that sort of stuff like wow. went from there and I think there were a couple other misfires of people who said they wanted to come and learn or wanted to do this and that but you could tell their hearts weren't really in it, their mm. actions didn't show. And I guess what I'd learned from Cosmic Sports before is pay attention to people's actions, not mm. their words. So I just let those kind of relationships slowly die off. But yeah, yeah between myself, Ali and Bola, like that was the ride or die for that company for, for its, the whole of its existence and okay. held it down. And and when did Dream Nation, like in tw- I know 2013, yeah. the creation, like what what spurred that? on and how did you manage the 20 people I okay, get you haven't there. even got to that yet there, okay. I wanna, I wanna, so. I wanna to get there. <laughs> there was a picture from that gala that went ridiculously viral um oh. like ridiculously viral um what happened what was in the picture so it was i think maybe about seven or eight of the girls that I attended mm-hmm. um they took that this really cool picture like of them being kind of silly but looking outstanding because they're all like i think their, i remember this picture uh, a lot of people don't actually know that's where it came from but yeah like oh. so they were all looking great because they're all in their like gala clothes yeah, etc yeah. but they were like pulling like gang signs and faces etc yeah. And the caption was something like, like two doctors, one dentist, yes, like two remember, something like that, like just naming all the things they're doing. Yeah. And I think it was just like a moment that showed people that you can be excellent um, and you can also still have personality and enjoy yourself. 
Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. We release new episodes every Sunday, so make sure that you subscribe and follow us so that you never miss out. If you'd like some more inspiration while you wait for the next new episode, then check out the recommendation above. Don't forget to follow us on social media and you can send us a question or a dilemma that you'd like us to answer on the podcast. This is Claude Williams, you've been watching Behind the Dreams and we look forward to seeing you at the next Dream Nation event.